Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. Good to see you all on the other side of the snowstorm. Um, in the light, nonetheless. Uh, so, yeah, welcome, everybody, to our last Naturals Journeys presentation for this season. Uh, my name is Sean, and I work here at the Nature Center. Um, first and foremost, I want to uh, say a bunch of uh, thank yous, and I'll invite you to join me in thanking our sponsors. Um, so, first up is Hunger Mountain Co op and 802 Coffee as our uh, lead sponsors. Yeah. And uh, also supporting Naturals Journeys is Washington Electric Co op, Concept Sioux, Onion River Outdoors, Capital Copy, Union Mutual, Northfield Savings Bank, and the Edward Jones Office of Keith LaCroix. So, help me out. Uh, <laughs> So uh, also, uh, before we get into the details of this evening, I want to invite everybody at some point uh, after the program tonight, if you haven't already, to check out the uh, amazing uh, art exhibit that's on the walls right now by Gabrielle Dietzel and Howard Norman. Uh, it's only going to be up this month, um, so make sure you uh, take a peek before you head out. Um, we have uh, hearing assist devices that are on the table in the, in the lobby there. If you uh, find that you need it, you can just um, hop back there and Ken or Naomi can help you turn it on and figure out how it works. It just slides over your ear and that'll help you hear Sam a little bit better um, if you need it. Uh, this is being live streamed right now to our website and the recording will be available. Well, it already is um, because it's being live streamed. So um, you can send uh, links to this um, presentation to your friends if you'd like. NorthBranchNatureCenter.org slash presentations is how you can do that. Um, finally, I, well not finally, I got plenty of stuff, but um, uh, I'll invite folks to hold your questions till the end. Sam has so much stuff to, uh, to talk about this evening, and, but we do have uh, plenty of time for Q&A um, at the end. So I'll invite you to hold your questions till the end if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> um, and with that, um, so uh, Samantha Ford has been a fixture here at the Nature Center kind of behind the scenes in a lot of capacities for five years now. Uh, Sam uh, helps co-teach some of our Vermont Master Naturals programs, has done some programs uh, around stone walls and cellar holes and barbed wire and that sort of thing, kind of reading the, reading the, uh, the landscape uh, sorts of classes with us. Uh, Sam's undergrad is in history and has a master's degree from UVM's Historic Preservation Program. Uh, and currently runs her own business called Turnstone Research, which is really all about um, kind of uncovering the story of places. So imagine like doing a genealogy, but not just on the people, but also on the land itself. Um, so I uh, put some business cards of Sam's in the, on the table in the back as well. So make sure those are all gone uh, by the end of the night, please. <laughs> um, and, um, and also uh, Sam has experience as the director of research at the Jackson Hole Historical Society and works with the Teton County Historic Preservation Board out there. So her historic work is kind of being featured all over the country. So we're really lucky to be able to bring her work right back here to the Nature Center and put her talents to work in uncovering the, the recent history of uh, this place we call North Branch Nature Center. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Sam Ford. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody to the former Fair, Fairvale Farm on lot 53 of the first division of lands in the town of Montpelier. Um, so as Sean said, I spent the last several weeks and months really digging into the archive and different types of resources to uncover all the details about the families that have lived here at this farmhouse and on this property. And so just a quick note about our timeline for this evening. Um, we'll be going back about 231 years. Um, obviously, North Branch has a much older, thousands year long history with the Western Abenaki, um, but tonight we'll be starting with just 231 years ago, and I'll save you the math, that's 1792. Um, 1792 is the first year we see a surveyor walking over this land um, with the intention of creating some boundaries for a sale that's about to happen. And so if we look at our map of Vermont in 1795, you can see most of Vermont is looking very Vermonty at this point. There's a few open spots in there. Uh, but if we zoom in a little bit, we can see Montpelier. Um, let's see if these fancy pointer right here. And you can start to see there are some uh, roadways or rather transportation corridors. Roadways is a really strong term at this time. Uh, these were more like bridle paths through the woods. Um, they were just wide enough for your horse and your wagon or a sled if you're willing to do this in the winter time to just comfortably make it through. Um, so in 1792, when we see the first family arrive on this property, um, you can start to get somewhat of an idea of maybe the routes that they took to get here. 
And if we zoom into that square of Montpelier a little more, we find more squares. Um, so this is the original lotting plan for the town. Um, there were several divisions of land that took place. Um, this was usually how most of the towns across Vermont were laid out. Um, this just, you know, wholesale boxes across a map without any landscape features was a more modern way. Um, Montpelier wasn't chartered until 1781, um, and so that's after Vermont became a republic, and so this was the new way of doing things, was just put boxes on the map. And so what we're looking at today is the first division of lands, which is these big squares right in the center here. There were 70 lots. Each of these 70 lots had 155 acres on each of them. Uh, the last five acres of that was set aside for future road systems. Um, and so this was a pretty symbiotic process of people arriving on the landscape and setting down their farms and starting to clear their lands. It was kind of obvious where the pathways would be going from there. You weren't always very surprised when the town came and said they had to put a road through your cornfield. Um, and especially at this point, those cornfields were really valuable, so we wanted to put the roads around them. Um, but yeah, having that extra little acreage tacked on the end for future roads um, was pretty common in most states and in most towns. Um, and so if we look at the town of Montpelier today, we've got our little red symbol up there for North Branch, where we're all sitting. And if we overlay that lotting plan, we see that we are indeed in lot 53, as I just said. Um, and so this is kind of the first step in piecing together the history of the land, is trying to go all the way back, figure out which lot we're on. So as I start to work through the deeds, um, hopefully someone will start referencing this lot 53 at some point. Um, sometimes it takes all the way until the early 1800s before I finally go, okay, I am in the right spot. Um, but this is a nice way to sort of orient ourselves to the map and the space that we're gonna be talking about. So I said that I start this process with the deeds um, this is pretty ubiquitous. The red books in any municipal office in Vermont are all of the deeds. I've got my trusty card file for the index in the center here. And then on the right, we have the very first deed that I was talking about from 1792. And so deeds are a really important resource. It's my first stop for starting um, a process like this. And it's because it relatively quickly um, will give you a list of families or a relative timeline for all of the people that have at some point owned or lived on this land. So everybody in green we will be covering tonight, I have picked these families specifically because they happen at really nice points on the timeline for when things were really happening and changing on this landscape. And a couple of these families were the longest lived on this land. So the Nye family and then the Warren family were both here for about 40 years each, which is pretty neat. And just a quick note, North Branch has been here for 27, so you guys are Almost there. <laughs> um, so anyway, we will start with that 1792 deed, and these are the boundaries that were described in it, which is most of that lot 53. And one of my favorite parts about going through the deeds is that sometimes you get really lucky and sometimes you get land descriptions or really specific descriptions of individual tree species. Um, certain land features I've read in deeds are things like beaver meadows, brickyards, um, sometimes fences, and they often will say stone fence or wooden fence, um, rocky outcrops, um, different brooks, bridges. Some of those things may not be around anymore, um, but what you can do with these land features is you can start to read between the lines essentially and piece together what this land used to look like. So if you know specific tree species, you can start to think about what does that mean for the soils here? What does that mean for the hydrology here? And is that significantly different from how we see this land today? So we've got um, some of our boundary markers here are the Great Rock in the center of the North Branch, um, which I assume is probably still there, perhaps is um, supporting the bridge that's over here on Gould Hill. We've got a maple tree, and then we've got four hackmatack trees, um, which upon seeing these words in the deeds, I was very confused. I thought those C's were eyes, and when you Google high matai tree, nothing comes up. So I immediately knew something was wrong. <laughs> um, but after a couple hours of you know, just staring at this word, all of a sudden I realized what if those eyes are C's, which would make a lot of sense, um, but 
what we may think of today as being associated with hack and tack, um, you may be thinking of tamarack or larch right now, um, but in the 1790s, that's not what hack and tack meant. That actually refers to balsam poplars, um, which I have been told are actually still on this land and actually right at the bottom of this hill over here, there are still some over there. And then we've also, at the very top, we've got some hemlock trees. And so you can start to think about uh, what this forest used to look like in the 1790s. And so this is before this land had been cleared yet. And another resource I like to use is newspapers. Um, after I get that nice timeline of names, you can start to search for these people in the newspapers. And sometimes you get really lucky and you get a land sale for this farm. Um, listed by Iram Nye. This was listed in 1835, and it gives us a really nice snapshot of what this farm looked like when he was ready to sell it. So it contains 120 acres, which I can tell you is exactly these boundaries, um, mostly under improvement. So at this time, improvement didn't necessarily mean it was cleared. It just meant it was being utilized in some way. And then they go on to say what that improvement was. So about 70 tons of hay were cut from it in the past season. The fences are good and pasturing sufficient for the farm. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that 70 tons of hay was coming off of all 120 acres. Um, in fact, from an early report in the 1860s, um, when Montpelier was already writing its own history, they talked about how incredibly fertile these lands were for the first settlers, and they had these incredibly large yields um, off of much smaller acreage than what we can get from the land today. And of particular importance, it says that the buildings are all new here in the 1830s. Um, that was something that actually didn't pop out to me until this morning, <laughs> for how many times that I looked at that little document. And so what did the buildings look like? Well, in 1835, it didn't look like this. Um, this is what the Nyes would have built on this land when they first arrived here. Um, hopefully they got here before winter, so the first thing you would do is create shelter for you and your family and you would build something very similar to this log cabin. So if we were to walk in that door, we would expect to find two rooms downstairs, either side of a large central chimney, um, which is no longer existent on this particular example. Um, but that upstairs would have had a really open, it would have been kind of like an open attic space, and that would have been additional housing for people coming through. So one of your first roles as one of the first settlers of any town was to host the next families coming in. and so. Even though you only had two rooms, this idea of privacy, having your own space to retreat to is an incredibly modern thing, like since the 1950s. This is like a very, very new concept for us. So this would have been a very comfy, a very cozy home, very warm home. Um, it would have had a relatively um, constant influx of either individuals or other families coming in. And in return for them coming in and you hosting them for a couple of weeks, they would then help you with your land clearing and then once they were able to move on to their own plots of land, you would also go and then help them. So that was this very nice community sort of um, atmosphere going on. Everyone's living in the same two rooms. <laughs> and so how many people were living in these same two rooms in the Nye family? So Iram Nye and Eleanor had seven children mm -hmm. by 1791. So if we remember that 1792 date, the third and most important resource is going through the genealogies. So you get to know the families, you get to know their children, how long did everybody live, and most importantly, um, we see they have their eighth child in 1796, born in Montpelier. So this gives us a really nice, very small window for when they arrived on the land. So they purchased the property in 1792. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they came here in 1792, but we know they're at least here by 1796. And we know that by the time they were comfortable enough to have a baby here, they had to have been here for at least a year or so. Um, so that gives us a really, really nice, very uh, specific window, which doesn't always happen. I have to say, researching this property was so much fun because there are so many details. It was like it was, you know, leaping at me to tell me the history of people who had been here, um, which is really neat. And so, in that same vein, I found one of the most unusual deeds I have ever encountered. Um, one of the th many nice things that Sean didn't mention about me is that my background is in land records themselves. I was the assistant town clerk in Williston for eight years. And so through that job and then through research, through Turnstone Research, I have probably looked at close to a thousand plus deeds at this point. This one is really cool to me and hopefully it will be to you too. <laughs> 
So this deed doesn't say anything about the land, doesn't describe how many acres there are, doesn't give me any land boundaries, but what it gives me is a really, really poignant personal example of this Nye family and their relationship with each other and with their land. So at the top of this deed, which I cut off, you can't see, but it says from Iram Jr. and Ellis to Iram and Eleanor. So these are their two sons, Iram and Eleanor are the parents. That doesn't make sense because usually you see the parents transferring the land to their kids. And so essentially this deed is a very long list of requirements that Iron Jr. and Ellis have to accomplish in caring for the family after the decease of their father. And so this is, it has a special clause in it which actually says that if these two boys do not fully um, follow through with this contract, the land will then revert back to their mother. But if they do accomplish everything within, um, this deed will be void. So essentially they will get the land themselves, which is a really, really highly unusual way of doing this. And so you can see that it was um, signed in February of 1802. Um, by June, Iron was dead. And so at this point he knew he was sick and he definitely knew he wouldn't be getting better. And in 1802, I can't forget, or I can't remember the math right now, but he was about in his 50s. So at this point, that may seem old for what you think of with um, life expectancy, but he was still really young. Um, and so he wanted to make sure that not only would his sons care for the rest of the family, but he chose to do this in a deed. He didn't do this in a will. He didn't go find probably the one lawyer in town and sit down and write this out with them. He tied their responsibility to their family to the land itself. Um, which I think speaks to how valuable this farm had become to this family. And this is 1802, so this is only 10 years after they had been on this property. But if you think about what happened in that 10 years, they cleared this land, they built their house, they had a child here, you know, this was something that meant a lot to them. And so some of the things, and they get, he gets really specific in his requirements. So for their mother, Eleanor, she is to have at her own disposal all of the household furniture, but also one cow, one one-year-old heifer, and eight sheep, and the ability to keep them through the winter. Now, normally you wouldn't keep surplus livestock through the winter, that's pretty expensive, requires a lot of um, upkeep to, and that's a lot of work to do that. So he's making sure that she will be absolutely taken care of. And in addition to all of that, she is also every year supposed to get 15 bushels of grain, a third of which to be wheat, seven bushels of Indian corn, 50 pounds of beef, 50 pounds of pork, 30 pounds of flax, two pounds of tea, and 30 pounds of sugar. And this is my favorite part, with enough firewood delivered at the door fit for firing. So pre-cut, <laughs> cut the wood for your mother. <laughs> and in addition to all of those things, they are to take good care of Eleanor in both sickness and in health. So he is transferring essentially his marriage contract onto his sons to say, take care of your mother. In addition to that, upon his decease, his, their married sisters are supposed to get $10 each, which is a pretty large sum at this time. And make sure that your unmarried sister also gets $10 in furniture equal to what her sisters got too. <laughs> and in case he wasn't done yet, they still had three younger brothers to take care of, and each of them were supposed to get good and sufficient meat, drink, clothing, and nursing until they turned 21, and then give them each $20 and make sure that they get a decent common education or teach them a trade or profession suitable to get a living. So by 1807, all of this was accomplished um, and this deed became void. And Eleanor lived until 1826, so she was actually here for most of the lifetime of the Nye family. And I think this is just a really, really beautiful example of how um, valuable this land felt to them to leave something like this and also just to remind you it didn't talk about the land at all instead it described the family it described the land and so this is a really nice look into just 10 years in um, at what this farm was able to produce which is a pretty significant amount and so in 1802 when that deed was signed just 10 years in this is probably roughly what this farm would have looked like so you're starting to clear your land you're starting to set out your farm fields, and you've got your, that little log cabin that I was talking about. And so by 1835, um, when they're selling the land, it looks something like this. And I actually really like these Harvard Forest dioramas because it, to me, is very similar and familiar to this property with the big hills. You've got the river going right through here. 
Um, but the one edit I would make to this is that farmhouse probably looked like that. And if you're squinting to see that because it looks familiar, it's because it is familiar. Um, this is our farmhouse. This is much later on. This is 1947. Um, but this has some incredibly specific architectural details. I was so excited when I saw this picture. Um, we've got this really wide cornice board under the eaves here. We've got these corner pilasters on either side um, supporting that cornice and the roof system itself. Um, we've got these really nice pedimented um, arches over the windows. We've got these transom lights on either side that go three quarters of the way down specifically. And even this doorway with all of the panels in it are absolute hallmarks of the Greek revival style, which was absolutely the popular style to do your house in, in the 1830s. Um, it lasted the height of popularity until about 1840. Um, you see some houses built in this style up through the 1870s. Um, and also, the one thing that really nailed it for me being in the 1830s is it's kind of hard to tell, but these are all six over six windows, um, which was an 1830s window. So, And by 1947, which, which is incredible, all of these details are still there and still just as readable as the day this was built. And so now that Iram Jr. has inherited the land from that very uh, specific deed, how many children did he have here? So he had 11 children in this farmhouse, <laughs> which is pretty incredible. Two sets of twins, even. Um, and so this family lived here until 1835. And I was trying to piece together the history of this farmhouse. And I have something very cool to show you. So this was from the 1835 deed. It gave us another really great description of the boundaries. And in it, it said, this is the starting point for this deed, exactly 209 yards south of Nye's dwelling house is a stake in stones. I was like, great. So at this point in my research, I wasn't totally sure um, if the farmhouse had been here. I'm sort of telling the story to you in reverse order. And so I was able to figure this out by use of surrounding deeds um, from the neighbors to figure out that exactly 209 yards south of where we are sitting right now is, as well, maybe not anymore, but there should be a stake in stones. And this particular one acre lot was sold off. I have a really great description for that much later in the 1870s. And so we can zoom this out to see in 1835 what I thought was the same 120 acres is a little bit different now. And so this is really neat because this is showing we've got neighbors now. He, they're selling and trading land on their borders, depending on what's important to the families that lived here, um, certain resources. So this 15 acre chunk over here went to live with lot 54, and then they purchased this little chunk of lot 70 for you know reasons that we can only guess at today. But we can start to piece together, this is the 1962 overlay, which is just nice to show how open this land was in the 60s. And you can you know, reverse back from that about 100 years and assume that where these farm fields are, those were probably a lot bigger. Most of this hillside was probably cleared off. And so that was just a neat um, little additional layer that we can add onto this. But what I really like about this property boundary, it almost looks like a bird in flight. And so that seemed particularly appropriate for North Branch. <laughs> And so we will say goodbye to the Nye family and move on um, 30 years or so to the Calkins and another really unique story that I uncovered here. Um, we will come back to the Nye family and discover why they would leave their new building in 1830. Um, that will come back to us. And so in 1861, Charles and Susan Calkins purchased this farm. Um, we have a few sales in between, but there were such short amount of time um, that I felt like I really wanted to focus on the Calkins because they owned this property throughout the um, 20 years of incredible change that happened here at North Branch. So we're coming from a very early subsistence family farm um, where you are producing everything from the land that your family needs. And there aren't, um, as I was talking about, there aren't really even road systems yet for the Nice in the early years. And so everything they need, they had to produce right here. And so that all changes um, as the Calkins come and things with town and different railroads and stuff come through. And so we can see that they all these red circles that Mrs. Calkins at this point owned quite a bit of property. And something else I want to point out, there is a railroad that bisects this property on this map. Um, this is this 1878 Beers map. So this is about 10 years after they purchased this property. And I was really shocked to find that there was a railroad here. There wasn't a railroad here. Right. 
This, if you read all the way down to the very bottom of the full map, it says proposed route for the Montpelier and Black River Railroad. And we are so lucky they found somewhere else to put this because we wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Hawkins, this would have, you know, bisected the most valuable part of the farm and this farm wouldn't have existed. So we, she purchased this property in 1861 with her husband. And so by 1878, I was like, oh, bummer, he must have died. So I went into the genealogies and found out he lived until 1890 and he was buried next to his spouse, Flora. And they got married in 17, or in 1878, which is when this map was made. So what's happening? This is very confusing. And like most things with this property, which is beautiful, the deeds told us. Um, this is probably one of my favorite clauses I have ever encountered, even beyond that like beautiful nigh deed that I was so eloquently explaining. So. In 1869, Mr. Calkins's lawyer, Albert Gilliam, deeded to Susan Calkins to her sole and separate use and free from the interference or control of her husband, <laughs> all of the livestock, horses, hay, grain, farming utensils, tools, and household furniture in and about the 206 acre farm. Mrs. Calkins got a divorce <laughs> and she got the farm. Um, so Mr. Calkins was a doctor. They were living in Boston. This was supposed to be their sort of country retreat. They went through a small um, purchasing, you know, program and added a few couple acres to the farm. So it's now 206 acres. And Mrs. Calkins is remembered in her obituary as being really generous. Um, she donated to a lot of causes in town. Um, she clearly got some money in the divorce settlement, which I have yet to uncover, and I don't know if I will. Um, but we also could see that she, by the time she sold this property in 1884, it was once again 150 acres. So she then made some money off of the land itself. Um, but what gave me a good laugh is I found this pretty late on. So she died in 1905, and the obituary goes on to say that she spent the greater part of her life in New York and Boston, where she lived with her husband, Dr. Charles Calkins. But since the death of Mr. Hawkins, she has traveled extensively, but has spent the greater part of her time in Waterbury and Montpelier. This is a very nice way of glossing over the fact that she had had a divorce. So this is saying she was a free and single woman. She did a lot of traveling for her. Her husband had died much, much later on. <laughs> and we also see references even in quotes in other articles about her as the widow Calkins. <laughs> And so everybody knew, this was very clear to the community what had happened, but I just thought this was a, a great little interlude um, into some of the private lives of the people that lived here. And so, you know, this is the 1860s. Divorce is seen as a very different thing than it is today. So it's not necessarily proper for a woman to get a divorce and then not remarry. So she, she chose to remain single, to live here in this farmhouse and to work this land with help of um, different hired hands and to make her own money and decide what she wanted to do with that money and donate it to certain causes in town, which is a really unusual story for the 1860s. I mean, it definitely did happen, but it was really great to see our own example right here. And so if we go into um, what happened to the landscape while she owned it over that 20 years, um, this land changed a lot. This is probably the most amount of change that this land has seen. And so in 1860, this is the year before she and Mr. Hawkins purchased the land. This is still a very small family subsistence farm. Um, this is probably really only supporting the farm itself with a little bit of surplus because um, by the 1860s, the railroad was in town. So we now have access to international markets. Um, but by 1870s under Mrs. Hawkins, uh, this has changed a lot. So the improved acres were just 85, now they're 200. And then we even get to see that the, of that 230 were woodlands. And the forest products in the 1870s were 200. And so if you fast forward another 10 years, um, the woodland is now down to 10 acres and only $45 of products come out of it. So there's a couple of things going on here. One, they definitely used a lot of it. Um, but also in the 1880s, the reliance on the land itself and things like wood products were just a lot less. And especially you didn't need to support your family with everything coming out of the land itself. By the 1880s, we have stores in town. Um, we have well-maintained roads going into town. So you can just go to the store and purchase the things that you need so that you don't have to use as much out of your dwindling um, wood supply. And most of these things aren't even wood anymore. Um, Fuel is even changing at this point. I mean, they're still taking 15 cords of wood, which is a considerable amount. Um, but at this point, we're seeing coal and things as more of fuel sources. 
But what's really interesting is they get really into um, livestock farming. So this is the 1870s, this is well after the sheep graze, but they still have 10 sheep on the property and that's producing about 50 pounds of wool. And so this is a really nice diverse farm. Um, they're doing dairy, they're doing sheep, they've got pigs here. Um, the crops are very successful in the products that they're getting out. And so by the 1880s, Mrs. Hawkins is getting older, she's starting to retire, she's probably less interested in um, the daily workings of the farm. And so things are starting to slow down just a little bit, but also as I was saying, you can now go and buy things that you need. You don't, you're not necessarily relying on your land in the same way. And we know in particular, Mrs. Hawkins was fairly wealthy by this point. Um, so this is probably just enough to keep the farm in production enough to sell it to someone else. And I have a neat um, picture of what the barns looked like here. So this is another picture of the 1940s. And so these barns, which I can't, I don't have enough time to take you through the architecture of them um, individually, but this suggests that this has been around at least since uh, Mrs. Hawkins was here. Um, the way that the barns are set up with the windows, we imagine there probably were cows in here. That was an early requirement during this time for how to house cows. And so this is a nice um, extension of what was happening on the land that was still visible here in the 1940s. And so in 1884, George Boyce arrives here, purchases this property, and we're finally at a point in history where we start to see pictures of these people, which is so exciting. So I introduced you to Mr. Boyce when he was fairly young, and then mostly what he looked like when he was living here. So he arrived here um, with his four younger children. Um, Leonore and Ida had already been married and were living out of the house at that point. And something of particular note to the North Branch crowd, I was pretty excited to find this in the newspaper. Um, he was so excited to find a nest of 60 mud turtle eggs that he put it into the newspaper. Um, and also just one other neat point, he's taking gravel from the North Branch. So this is a nice example of utilizing all of the resources available to you. Um, and so we think of social media today as a giant overshare, but I would bet anyone go back to a 19th century newspaper and you will find out more about these people than you can find about anybody today on social media. Um, so when George and Laura went back to Faston for the weekend, so for two days, front page news. Um, <laughs> And so another really awesome find in this overshare of newspapers was in 1884, the addition of 13 rolls of wallpaper in two hours, which is pretty incredible, um, in the house of George Boyce. So this is shortly after they purchased this house. And so like much of us do today, you get a new house, you're gonna repaint it, put up some new wallpaper. And for, I'm hearing some sounds that people may be familiar with this wallpaper. Um, <laughs> if you open the basement door, it's right there. And what's really neat is that it's still right there. And it's got this really nice metallic pigment in it, which was incredibly popular in the 1880s and 1890s. So I have a pretty good hunch that this is the wallpaper referenced in this newspaper article. <laughs> And so this is the 1880s. I was saying we've got different types of farms, different types of farming. And so Mr. Boyce does something really different with this farm. So he, we know he still has cows because um, we see this nice article about dogs chasing the horses and cows, um, which is a pretty big deal at this point. And it also injured some of this livestock. And this livestock, as you can probably imagine from this article, was really valuable. Um, so this was the Fairvale Stock Farm. This is where we get that Fairvale name I use uh, when I welcomed you all here, he's the first one to use it. I do not know where it comes from or why he chose to name it, but you know, look at the property, it's you know, pretty pretty. Um, and so he chooses to go in an entirely different direction. So he has these fancy stallions and horses. He's got a couple, all of them are named in all of these articles. And he takes them to the fair, he puts them in races. And apparently he does pretty well because people talk about the pedigrees. These come up a lot in the newspapers and Let's see. The best posted horsemen in the country declare that there are no better bred horses in the world than those in the stud house at the Fairvale Stock Farm. So this was pretty significant in the 1880s. And he was really successful with this enterprise. And so this is a really nice example of the different types of farming options in the 1880s that you don't always hear about. And I was lucky enough to find a photo of Mr. Boyce, his hired hand, and his grandson sitting in those barns in that photo I showed you earlier. So I would love to know where this was found there, sharpening a saw. And it's just a really neat little snapshot into the Boyce family life on this property. And we are going to move along to the next owners. Um, so in 1884, Mr. Boyce sold the land to the Warren family. 
we can meet Jer and Mary Warren here. So far, I have been extremely nice. I have not shared with you the deaths that have happened on this property, but we're going to get to know the Warren family really well. So I'm gonna start off with a bang here. Um, I found this pretty early on in my Warren family research. The remains of Oliver C. Waite, late of this place, Montpelier, and Jer C. Warren have been removed from the vault at the Greenmount Cemetery, scanned down to the bottom. Mr. Warren's remains were temporarily held in the grounds at his home on the Worcester Branch Road in the winter of 1905, previous to the erection of the Hubbard Chapel. This was posted in 1913. Mr. Warren died in 1905 in March. It doesn't take much to figure out what March looks like on this property, especially after the snowstorm we just had. So it's a pretty fair guess that Mr. Warren was buried in the basement because there was no other ground available to them. And whether he stayed in the basement until 1913 or they removed him to somewhere else on the property, I don't know. Um, but if you go down the basement, you can say hello. Um, he's not down there now, um, but you know, just remember he was there. And so with that, we will look at the other person mentioned in that article. So Oliver Cromwell, wait, was the father of Mary. So if I'll remind you, 1904 is when the Warren family purchased this property. Um, and then Jared died very suddenly, very young, only a year later. And so Mary was left with a lot of young children by herself trying to manage this farm. So her 80 year old father decided to move down um, from Georgia to live with her and to help her take care of the farm. And unfortunately in 1913, as he was getting into bed, he knocked over his oil lamp, which set the bed and his own clothes on fire. <clears throat> And since at this point he was in his late 90s, the injuries were too severe and he did eventually pass away 24 hours later. And there was also a nice other piece of information I found out about him was that he was sick for a long time before he had come to live here. And his illness was pretty severe, contraction of the throat such that he could not swallow a particle of solid food without the influence of opiates. Um, but a couple of years, so that was in October, by December, he was all better. And it was decided that he had blood poisoning from a bee sting um, because he kept bees on his farm. Um, so as I'm, you know, working through this research, suddenly I'm becoming an expert on, you know, 18th century or 19th century divorces. How sick can you get from a bee sting? Um, what were the types of stock horses that were available then? Were they here, you know, for, you know, the Google searches I have done in service for this project are pretty incredible. Um, but to sort of take us to a much lighter, happier note, here's a photo from the 1980s. We've got, you know, the farmhouse is looking a little bit different. Some of those features are now removed. Um, and after Mr. Waite died and after Jared died, uh, Mary passed on her farm to her daughter, Carolyn. Carolyn married someone named Leroy Pickard, and together they were the next generation of Warrens on this farm. And they really brought the farm back at this point. We see a lot of ads in the newspaper for their roadside market. And as I was reading through this ad and seeing the thing about pie pumpkins, it made me think about this photo from the 1980s. So I thought it would be a nice, you know, um, sort of similar image about 40 years apart. Uh, but maybe this is what that farm side market looked like. And there were also tons and tons and tons and tons of hits for the dairy that was produced here, which apparently it was pretty good. Because um, they go on to say the Fairvale Farm Heavy Jersey Cream is better because it is clean from clean, healthy cows and a clean, sanitary dairy. So you really want to have this cream. And they would often sell the strawberries and the cream together in their roadside markets. In addition to oops, hosting corn roasts on the property with yard games illuminated by gasoline and Jap Japanese lanterns. So they would host the community for community gatherings here. But sadly, the happy colorful picture could not last forever because Carolyn then dies early herself in 1933 um, of liver cancer. Uh, and then her husband runs the farm for a couple of years, but in 1935, the family decides that it is time to sell most of the things happening on the farm at auction. And instead of him taking this land, since he now owns it directly, he is not related to the Warrens other than by marriage, he decides to actually deed it back to them. This land was that important to them, you know, this is where they had raised their families, where they had buried their husband, and this was so important that it goes back to uh, Mary's daughter, Lucia, who dies a year later. Very sorry to hear about that, Lucia. Um, and eventually we see Statira and Mary are living here together um, as retired women, so they had sold off all of the farm equipment and that equipment 
was some of the last that we see here for this large scale farming operation. So at this point, this farm is still 150 acres. It goes well to the other side of Elm Street. And so this is the last time that we see a family associated with that large uh, farming parcel. And then as we move into um, future generations after the Warrens had owned it, um, all of the larger pieces get sold off and we're left with the about 30 acres, I think that's here today. And so what's neat is that Statira sold this land or sold this house in 1943. And if we go back to this picture, which was taken in 1947, this is only three years later. So you can almost imagine her walking out of her family home for the last time, turning around, seeing this, and then moving on with the rest of her life. And what's really neat is to think about, you know, all the way back to the Nye family, there are 11 children that were born here. They were the people who built this house and all of the children that have been in this home over the last 200 years and all the children that continue to be here today. You know, when I was going through the North Branch Flicker trying to find pictures of the older farmhouse, it was so funny how often it's featured, you know, with the kids up front and then the little white house in the background. And so this, <laughs> this little white house has always been here, has always been supporting all of these people over all of this time. And so, as I said, the Nye family built this and we're going to come back to the Nye family and just really further uh, nail this point home that this farmhouse was indeed built in the 1930s and is potentially even older than that. Um, so if you go down into the basement and you're looking around, you will find some very charred beams down there, which is very interesting to me. This is a mystery I'm still quite trying to figure out completely, um, but I think I'll get there eventually if the house is kind enough to tell me. So these beams are really charred, but the floorboards above them are not. Um, these particular floorboards were put in the 1860s. Um, so that sort of answers that question. But in other places, the floorboards, you can tell by the saw marks that are on them, were 1830s floorboards. So if this house was built, this fire happened before this house was built. So my assumption, and we also have this little mortise joint that is missing its tenon, and then we have also right here, which I think I put a circle on, I did, what I think is an old marriage mark. So this dates from scribable framing, which is about in the 1830s, um, and much before it kind of ended in the 1830s. And so my hypothesis is that the actual timbers that are used to build the farmhouse are from a much older structure and potentially from that original log cabin that the Nye's built because all of these are hand hewn and they're hand hewn in a way that we don't see being used in the 1830s anymore. And so my assumption is that at some point the Nye's had some level of catastrophic fire because this is not a small fire that happened. <laughs> and they were able to reuse, I'm not sure that I would make that same choice, but they were able to reuse a lot of these timbers, um, you know, the original reuse, recycle to a, you know whatever extent possible and continued and then rebuilt the next generation of the house. So if you go through this catastrophic fire, you're on this land that was so valuable that your dad had to deed, go through all that process of that deed we went through, why would you leave in 1835? Especially if this house was brand new. Well, in 1834, I'll bring you back to Benjamin Nye, who's the first child who was born here at North Branch. He was the first settler in Montpelier, Iowa. <laughs> Familiar name, huh? So he arrived there in 1834. This is, you know, the Western frontier at this point. He found this land, said this shall be named Montpelier. And he built this grist mill. That grist mill obviously is still there. This is a very modern photo. I got this from Google. And exactly 200 years prior to Benjamin Nye arriving in Montpelier, Iowa, Benjamin Nye arrived in Sandwich, Massachusetts in 1635 and was the first person to build a house in Sandwich, Massachusetts. Sandwich is where Iram Sr. brought his family from to come to this farmhouse and this land. Well, I mean, they built the farmhouse. <coughs> Both the original Nye house still exists and that grist mill still exists. There is the Nye Museum. And so if you like collecting your historic families, you can go and see these other buildings that are associated with the Nye family. And so this is a really neat story of a family through several generations um, is a part of this, you know, really nice pioneering spirit that we get in the first half of the history of the United States. And it's really neat that all of these houses and buildings that are associated with them are still there, have still been cared for by successive generations of people. <laughs>
And so that was the story that I had to share with you today of the North Branch Farm. And this is just so cute, I had to find somewhere to put it. So <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, open to any questions you have. Not, yeah, so Montpelier was around for about 10, 12 years before the Nias got here, um, but they were one of the first families to come up to this so town. So it just was coincidence that they were from Montpelier, Iowa? So, oh no, they named Montpelier, Iowa. Yes, yeah, so when they arrived Iowa. here in Vermont, this was already Montpelier, so in 1834 when they went out to Iowa, he was like, let's call it Montpelier. Oh, <laughs> so hi. Hmm? So the Benjamin Knight house and sandwich would that have been named after a great grandfather, or do you think he eventually ended up there and somehow took over this old New Yeah, so house? this Benjamin Nye is the third great grandfather of our Benjamin Nye directly. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so going all back, of them were yeah. named Benjamin, and then all of them were named Iram, essentially. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? I saw on your timeline um, one of the entries that you didn't talk about was the uh, Montpelier Town Farm. Mm -hmm. Property was mm -hmm. part of that, and most of it we associate being across the street somewhere. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the it was right down here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, do you know anything more about? I spent a little bit of time looking into that because I thought that was a really important part of the story. Um, I had to leave that on the cutting room floor, but I, there's not a lot of research or a lot of available research on the town farm, which was also called the poor farm in Montpelier. And so these were places where if you were really down on your luck and you either owed a lot of people a lot of money or for one reason or another you lost your own farm or you became homeless for some reason, these poor farms were places where you could go, the town would support you and there's, um, they weren't always the best places to be. It depended on the specific caretakers. There were several of them over time. Some of them were really nice and really helped these people. Some of them were really not nice. And so I really didn't wasn't able to find a lot about this particular Montpelier poor farm, but it was right where CCV is. And so it would make sense to me that in 1835, this really valuable piece of land was just sold essentially to the neighbors. Um, but it wasn't the part of the town farm for very long. The, um, for whatever reason, the town decided to sell off this parcel within five years or 10 years, I think. So it wasn't, I think it was too far north perhaps for them to maintain both properties. Yeah. Just thinking, they had you know, a handful of animals that they had to winter, and it was a productive farm. How did they, how did they keep the soil going? How did they keep it sustainably productive? Mm -hmm. Um, well, that would change depending on which generation was here. So for early on with the knives, there was this neat thing that I read in the 18th century 1860 history of Montpelier, and I wish I could remember the specifics now, I forgot to bring the book with me, but it said actually that these early generations were able to plant 10 successions of corn in the same soil without having to turn it over or add any manure to it because it was so rich. And the products they were getting from that were well beyond anything we could try today. Um, well, maybe not today, but at that point in the 1860s, um, they were already in awe at how productive this was. And so fairly early on, they didn't need to do a lot. Um, but later on, by the time we see the Calkins owning this property, um, probably some sort of form of field succession was in. So you have, you know, the field you're using now, the field you used last year, and then the field you used next year. And you really needed 200 acres to be able to sustain something like that, to have to leave a certain amount of acres unused. And so as you're rotating around, um, so that would change a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and you know, manure systems. And by the 1880s, we see agricultural journals coming along. A lot more people are literate, so you would subscribe to these journals and they would tell you the newest science about how, like, do you have a field that's really, you know, not performing the way it should be? Try all of these things. And some of, were six of, some of them were successful, some were. So that really depends on, you know, a lot of specifics. <laughs> and they skipped the sheep here? Um, I think they did. So what's really interesting about our timeline, let's see if I can go back to one of them. What we would think of as the sheep years were, well, so I guess the Nyes were here. We don't have tons of records of like what kinds of sheep they had on the property or what was going on. But also in the successive years after that where we would expect to see sheep, um, this property changed hands pretty quickly. I'm not totally sure why that was. I think a lot of people, 
really liked the idea of living here and for whatever reason different things happened to all of them where they had to move on a couple of them defaulted on mortgages and this gets pretty complicated in this little area um, where a lot of things are going back and forth and so yeah I don't think sheep really had a large history on this property um, I think the families that were here had other priorities and then in the time frame where we would expect to see them it was just changing hands too many times for someone to really come here and specialize in any sort of farming. Your research is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <coughs> yes, a friend. Um, so when you talked about um, that, that really uh, thing that was kind of like a will, but it was really a, a deed, mm -hmm. uh, and they said $10 to the, to the daughters and 20 dollars do you have any idea what that would be in today's dollars? I thought about that, and I didn't look it up, but... So in 1802, what Montpelier would have looked like, there wouldn't have necessarily been anywhere to spend that money. Um, <laughs> so th it may not specifically mean like here's a $10 bill, it may mean like $10 in value of something else, um, or it may have been in fact some kind of money, but at that point there weren't a lot of places to spend it. It was probably more of an investment into their future for future um, furniture and things they needed to buy for their own farms where they're living or to then go and buy their own properties with because it is a significant amount of money I mean I feel like if you were to hand a $10 bill to like a 10 year old today they'd be super excited about it and so if you can imagine that in 1802 that's you know that's a lot of money um, I can probably I don't want to guess because I'm not good at math but you can probably google that right now if you want to look up the on it. Great. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's $10, is it $10 or $20? Um, $10 to the girls, <laughs> 20 to the boys. Okay. Um, so, uh, apparently it's uh, $238 today. So, not a huge amount. Well, so, yeah, money translations don't always, it's tricky. That doesn't um, seem to be enough. Because you have yeah. to, no, yeah, it's not always like a direct $200 to us today would be nice, but it's not enough to go buy a house with, yeah. especially not now. Um, but to think about how many families had that much cash on hand at that time to hand out to their kids, um, they were doing pretty well, which is, was nice to see that. Plus a lot of it was paper money. And, a lot right. of it was gold and silver, which had an inherent value of itself. Yeah, and that's also a really good point. Yeah, because it's small. Can you get a chance to go back to the slide with the productivity, back to the... the uh... This one? Yeah, look at the oats. I'm just blown away. Three right, acres, 225 bushels of oats on three acres. This, this river bottom land was something. Yeah. For a while, at least mm -hmm. until they played with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I really like about the 1880 census, is it actually will tell you what, how many acres this was produced on. So right. if we were to you know, take that 1860 history at face value, you can imagine that this was probably less or about the same amount of land. Uh, yeah. It was also interesting that uh, between 1870 and 1880, the production of butter dropped from 250 to 150 pounds. It's just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was looking at that, and it's only two less cows, so I'm not quite sure if they just weren't being very um, careful. I know if you like treat your cows really nice and they're really happy, they will produce more milk per cow than cows that aren't treated very well. So I don't know if something like that was going on or. They had more just swine other and milk used to feed swine. priorities. Oh, great! Yeah. So there we go. Sure, they, they sell <laughs> milk as well. uh, yeah, right. I'm curious about the flax, which they oh. not grown it, but in that deed, they left a certain amount of flax uh, to the mother, mm -hmm. and she would probably be weaving her clothes and oh, flaxes absolutely. for mm -hmm. linen. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if they are not growing it, or at this point, not growing it locally, if you would have any idea where that would come from. Yeah, I think that, I think you answered your own question, um, in that by the 1860s, they probably didn't need to produce their own flax, because you could go to, there were easier ways to get your clothing in the 1860s than there was in 1802, when we were looking at that deed. So 60 years earlier, they were growing flax somewhere on this property, we would have to assume, um, and probably making their clothes from it, which is pretty neat. And so by this point, you probably just wasn't a resource you needed anymore out of your land. Because flax is the easiest thing to grow. 
Okay. Right. Yeah, so it could be that. It, that's another thing is occurring to me is that in the 1860s, this isn't super detailed information, so that may have not been a priority for them to track in the ag census, just because it was something that was, you know, so common on every farm, you were expected to have some portion, so we don't really need to know about that. We want to know, like, what the market stuff was. So both of those are possibilities. Yeah. So I have a comment that leads to a question. Um, we have a mini farm in East Montpelier, and we are required, even with the small thing, the small amount that we produce, we're required by the ag census to fill out a form. And there's a penalty if you don't do it. And um, I've been doing it for a farm we just had. We've had honey and eggs and you know maple syrup and some you know firewood type stuff. So we have to report that even today. And I'm just curious then how you got this farm's information. I've never, I've never researched our farm backwards through the egg mm -hmm. census, so I'm curious oh, how you that got would this be cool. information. Yeah, um, I can give you this information. So UVM has these three censuses available through their special collections department. Some of them are scanned and online. Montpelier had not been. Um, until I was assisting someone with the North Branch property, so she and I were able to both use this information. So it's something that, as a part of this project um, announcement for North Branch, I have created your archive for you. Um, so this information will now be in your archive, and you can, you know, publicly available, you can release it to whoever wants it. So, so you would have to go through the deeds, which is not a small thing, um, figure out your own timeline, and then find those names on the Ag Census, and to be able to figure out what was produced on that property. But you can go to USDA and... No, they don't have that available online. So you kind of have to Google around. So Williston is online as a part of their barn census. Montpelier, everything is at UVM at Special Collections for all of the ag censuses for the state during these three years. So you would have to go, what we had to do was go make an appointment and scan it ourselves. But I now have those digital files so I can just email them to you. Um, you would then have to go through the deeds to figure out who the names were. Right, and, and we know the names. I just oh, okay. haven't so then, easy. been as aware of these records. Yeah, these can be tricky to being find. <laughs> accessible, you mm -hmm. know, to find out what, what maybe was recorded or wasn't. These are yeah. like on the microfiche, set, right? Yeah. So you have to like yeah. plug in the thing and use the machine go back and, and all of that. Really. So. So mm -hmm. thanks for doing the hard work uh, so that yeah. we don't have to do Personally, that. Personally, I didn't. I sent Erica to go do it. Oh, okay. um, so <laughs> we can thank Erica. <laughs> so I was like, great, you should go find it, and then I can use it for North Branch. <laughs> so uh, also, more yeah. locally, there the microfilm are also at the uh, oh, okay. Historical Society Library. Gary, if you don't want to drive all the way oh, to... Oh, it's all the way to Burlington, yeah. Oh, for the uh, To the yeah. access, yes. Okay. They're actually owned by the Department of Libraries which is now in the same building as the historical society. Mm -hmm. So they're not digitized. Right, yeah. But if you, I don't know, how, how much did you digitize the whole All panel? of Montpelier, yep. All of Montpelier. So I have all of Montpelier for these three years. Um, and then maybe at some point you can find them on the North Branch website. <laughs> no? <laughs> we'll give them to you, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can just send you an email. Uh, yeah, I'll go in the back. So I have more information on the Warrens. Um, oh, cool. So we, we looked across the street because I was doing some research into a part of our land that I think might have been part of this plot. Mm -hmm. um, and some descendant of the Warrens posted a memory book um, that was written by one of the Warren daughters. And it mostly talked about their life in Georgia, but it also yeah. talks about when they came here and when their father died and what a shock that was. Yeah. Um, and this was posted on somebody's like you know, personal web page, and it's since been taken down, but it is on the Wayback Machine if you go there. So I can direct you to where you can read this memory book. And it yes, I <laughs> definitely <laughs> want to talk to you about that. It, it really gives all this personal, like, you get to know the family and what their personalities are like. And it's oh, cool, and even stuff. better, yeah. Oh, I would love to read that. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah, Naomi. So I'm curious about the the hand-hewn timbers that you think, you know, the, the, the farmhouse timbers, and if your mm -hmm. thought is that those were from the original farmhouse, mm -hmm. then would those have been grow, you know, those grew on this land, did that fire happen on this land? Is there yes. a fire record for mm -hmm. some time? I, I'm, I'm very curious about that, and if you think which ones or all of them were. Yeah, I think 
Most of them have been, because what first set me off on this was the ones that were in the kitchen and then as you go into the library and then that little front office, uh, especially if you look up at them, um, these ones don't necessarily, they were sited in a way that you can't see those like missing openings anymore. Um, you can where the bay window was, or now is, where there used to be a wall. Um, but if you look up at them, you can see where lath marks and little nail holes were all along them. And so those were either a part of a prior wall or a part of a prior ceiling, but the next one over doesn't have those marks at all. It's like one in the library has that, and then there's a few more around, and especially if you go in the basement, stuff has changed a lot down there. Um, so some of that may just be timbers being removed over time. Um, there are a couple successions of renovations going on here, so there's other things later from the 1860s and the 1890s were two other big years for this house for things to change around. Um, but yeah, that fire that happened in the basement, I was able to find a couple other fires happened here, which were small chimney-like fires and just kind of a brief mention and wouldn't have caused that level of damage. Um, when I found the all overweight thing, I was like, was this bed in the basement? Um, but no, <laughs> well, that was just one of the only fires. But if you, what's really tricky is I, it had to have happened before 1830 when this house was built. And Newspapers then weren't as detailed as they were in the second half of the 19th century. And also, if you do like a 1790 to 1830 search for fire, um, that comes up with several thousand hits of keywords. So at some point, I do plan on going through those because I really want to figure this out because I've been aware of those charred beams in the basement for several years now. And I was so excited to do this project. Got all of these other wonderful questions answered except for that one. So I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> so maybe it was the impetus to move from the log cabin to the bigger farmhouse. And potentially, yeah. yeah. Um, families usually did that um, by the 18th, so the Knight family probably would have done that anyway. It's just we have this other evidence of this event that had happened yeah. at some point. Um, and those timbers may even be from a barn that burned down. Doesn't necessarily mean it was the house. Um, but throughout all of my research, fires were extremely common. And um, if they are that old, does it mean that those trees are probably, they're from trees on this? I, yeah, I would say even if I turn out to be wrong and those are timbers from the 1830s, which really wouldn't make sense because of where they are and there isn't any damage on anything else around them for um, pieces of this, pro or pieces of the house that are contemporary to the 1830s don't have damage. Um, so to me, those timbers came from something else that would burn down. Um, but even somehow that's wrong. In the 1830s, they wouldn't have gone very far. So those timbers that built this house came from right here. It's just how old were they and what year were they cut down? Working on it. Uh, Sean, how's it gone yet? Okay, well, back corner. I want to know what happened to the barns. Like I don't know. Um, I have some pictures of the Brown family that lived here. You can, we have pictures in the archive that I wasn't able to include tonight of dismantling one of the barns that was here and then using some of that material to build the barn that is here. Um, so that happened in the 80s, but for that 1947 photo I had of the little girl with her bike, those came down before then. Um, maybe even when the Warrens were auctioning off everything, potentially in the 1930s is when something like that would have come down because that timber was still really valuable um, to be reused somewhere else. So it's possible. And you still see it today, people come to farm auctions and want to buy the barn. So, uh, yeah, Emily. So when we were first looking at that photo together, the girl on the bike, you and I were, right. we were wondering yeah. about whether that was possibly not taken here, but it seems like you decided it definitely was. I spent a lot of time trying to yeah. figure out exactly where, like from the, you know, looking at the forest behind her and where the sun angle is, where would these barns have been on this property? I tried looking at LIDAR, I tried looking, I've got a, uh, question in, so there's the 1962 aerial overlay, there's also the 1942 or 43 or 39. I emailed um, the state to figure out, can I come look at this just to see in the 30s or 40s, what did, what did it look like from above? Because in the 60s, they're not here. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out where they were. My hunch for now is that they were probably somewhere either where I am standing, because there's enough space between the end of where the farmhouse was and where she's standing with the sun angle for those barns to be somewhere right here. And this was all regraded, so that's kind of difficult to tell now. But one of them was a bank barn, and there was a very slight bank right about where I'm standing, which would have been about the right height to build a barn into it. Yeah. Um, but what, and I 
What's interesting is the big barn that we can see, like the gable peak behind her. That was definitely one of the ones I think that got moved and was put here where those two mm -hmm. other, there were two other barns that were right here. Um, I mean, I can show you those photos. Should we go look at them? Or I don't know how we're doing on time. If anyone's got to go, I could be here forever. <laughs> um, but I've spent a lot of time trying to figure that out, and I'm still working on it, essentially. Uh, yeah. Have you <clears throat> several questions? Okay. Have you sounded anywhere out here to see no. looking for stone foundations? Because a lot of times you'll find uh, <clears throat> sometimes they are actually some parts of it stone floor and you yeah, can find okay. them laid right out there if you take a rebar and, yeah. and a hammer and go Which around and sense. you know kind of <clears throat> uh, and what how is the timber that's charred uh, <clears throat> is that still well tied in with the mortise and tenons yeah, At to the ends, there's no, there's no locking dogs or anything holding those to mm -hmm. the... Some of it is hard to tell with the new HVAC system that's down there. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have a ton of time to really go poking around, and I didn't really want, I didn't know how far I should be poking around down there. Um, <laughs> but for tonight, that was, I was like, okay, I will have further access to the space, maybe with more permission, and... <laughs> you know, start to figure that out. But there's three timber, three or four down there, um, all in a row. They were put, they're underneath the kitchen, essentially. Um, and everything else down there doesn't have any fire damage to it. So it was interesting, they're all in one spot. And they're not, they're, they're mortise and tenon, there's not metal fasteners, I don't think, that are- No, no, yeah. So that whole, the whole farmhouse itself is timber framed, um, the original right. framing. Well, and sometimes what, what happens if they, had to replace those. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't. They couldn't fit them in very well. You know, with the tenons still on. Yeah, and, right. You know, with the rest of the building in place. And so I, I was just curious if that, if you could tell anything from, from looking at how they're tied in the corners. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> and to the. Yeah, I un should. Under. The after party will be in the basement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go look. <laughs> Yeah, it's in a particular it's corner that's just, it's really hard to get to. There's a lot of stuff to be able to look all the way up to the wall, so. And the other thing I was wondering is, <laughs> have you researched any of the meadows and different woods around here for which parts of the farm were used for what? Not yet. Yeah, that was... If I had two hours tonight, there's a lot more information that we would be able to get into. <laughs> but yeah, all of this is stuff that I would love to continue to dig deeper from. This is all essentially what I shared with you is very surface level information for like the work that I do and for other historians. This is all mostly made from what was publicly available information and yeah. then using a lot of expertise for like other pieces of history that I'm familiar with and other re and specific resources to sort of read between all of these lines and figure out what are the family stories here. But yeah, there's lots of further levels we could get into this property with. So maybe we'll have a part two next year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, request from the cutting room floor. Um, could you give us a little teaser into what you're finding about the bricks um, on the property? That's maybe? right. Yeah, I didn't get to that. We didn't. Um, so if we go back to this, particular deed description, one of the other boundaries I had to figure out from wherever the stake and stones was from wherever the house was, because this was prior to my conviction that, that this was that house. The other one was up here at this point, which was two rods north of the mouth of the brook, just north of Nye's brickyard, which I was like, great, so helpful. Um, which brook? Is the brook still there? Like, did they mean one that used to be there? Or is it one of the two that's there now? Where was this brickyard? So I was asking Sean, so I was like, I know you took clay for projects from this prop, like where was that? And so somewhere between this point and this point, Nye had a brickyard here. And what I have noticed a couple of times poking around the basement is there are some handmade bricks down there. And I actually forgot I meant to go down there and grab one. So I will show you all. Um, so I haven't really, paid attention to them a lot. It's one of my projects over, you know, the next little while is to go look at them. But I'm pretty sure, because there's 
a wide degree of variation in the firing. Some are really dark, some are really light, like really light salmon bricks. And that would suggest to me a very handmade quality. Um, usually if you're buying bricks from a brickyard, they're all very uniform and the same because they're selling a product. But also for the Nyes in the 1830s, I didn't do any research to figure out were there other brickyards in Montpelier, but also if you've got bricks, you know, a clay deposit that's right here, <laughs> you would go use it. Um, and so that would be a pretty neat thing to also continue to figure out is where was that clay deposit he was using? Is it still there? Oh my gosh, so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Someone hasn't gone yet. Yeah, um, there's a lot of bricks in the river right from that stretch today. Uh -huh. I'm wondering if all right, well, let's go for a walk. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I'll be back tomorrow for a different reason. So, if you're around, <laughs> I want to know now. But I guess they've been there for a couple hundred years. They'll still be there. So, I can wait. <laughs> um, yeah, Just a thought on your hemlock or your beams. Uh, grew up in a house that had charred beams like that from a stove fire above it. Oh. It burned down through the floor. Mm -hmm. A Franklin stove that was tucked in a corner. It's above the kitchen, and yeah. Because it's highly unusual to use, reuse beams and and use the charred end of it because mm -hmm. of the strength. So I'm just wondering, maybe it was a fire above it, it burned down through the floor and they saved the top in place. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, the that specific area of those beams, the floorboards that are right above it, are from the 1830s. Um, but that's plenty of, you know, maybe it was a brand new house. They immediately had an accident with the fire sure. and then right away replaced the floor. So that's also a possibility. That's a good thought. I never thought about the fire coming from above. And it comes, it definitely, the further back towards the corner you get, the more damaged they are. As they go, you go from this end of the kitchen and go towards the front of the house, it gets better. So I guess that's always been the kitchen, um, if we're going with this theory, which is neat. <laughs> Think about stove being against the wall. Huh. And you have... I what that wall looks like. Do you know what uh, property across the road, how it was used on this side? Um, only as it relates to this one, but the house that's over there, I don't. I didn't look into that. Um, but the land that was over there was a part of this parcel. If you look at that. Right. So this little house... Um, but maybe it's up here. I don't know. Um, I do know that this road that's across the street used to extend a lot further back, and there was another homestead that was back in here at some point. Um, but yeah, I didn't. My main focus was what would have been happening right here, and then we got some extensions of information. But I was trying to focus on our property. But you know, there's always time for more. <laughs> yeah. Um. If you go back to the census, I don't know if they're still called slides. <coughs> I'm curious about 1860, 1870. You've got five years of civil war in there. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And they look at the improvement of how much land. So I'm doubly impressed because I do know statistically Vermont sent more men to fight in the Civil War than any other state. Yep. And I'm just wondering who was left to do all this. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. It's the women, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing I would say about the river is you have to remember mm -hmm. the 27th flood would have changed the course. And we just don't know by how much. Mm -hmm. That's really it to the river. And yeah. Crops yeah, I was thinking about that when I was going back to this history. I think the 27th flood would have happened during the Warren family being here. So I wonder how that affected them, which would be interesting to know. Or what, if there was any change in the yeah. river through this part. All do you know? <laughs> I can speak to that just a little bit. When we look at the uh, like the lidar imagery, which is basically like um, like aerial photography, but it looks at micro changes in elevation and topography, you can actually see old the old river channels through the field here, and they actually are tracing the places that you would kind of expect them to be. So out out here, there's lines of uh, alder bushes that are growing, 
that's that's where the river path was. And the other one you can see is right goes right underneath the community garden, which also makes sense because that's had a nice big fresh blast of sediment. <laughs> um, so. Um, yeah. Um, just uh, since I know we're approaching some folks' bedtime, uh, I want to uh, give folks the opportunity to, uh, to head out here. Feel free to stick around, ask more questions of Sam, come up front, chat. If you want to take a visit to the basement, you're welcome to do that too. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, um, help me thank Sam for joining us tonight. Yeah.